Well, good evening, and uh, I'd like to call to order this committee the whole meeting for the Town of Saugeen Shores, and I'll extend a welcome to everyone in the ch Council Chambers this evening. Our first order of business is a declaration of pecuniary interest, and I'll remind every member of your responsibility. And declared, then we have no additions, deletions, or amendments to the agenda. And this evening we have two delegations. And the first one is Pat Sanigan. She's here with the Canadian Federation of University Women about the annual vigil. Welcome, Pat. Am I on? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council members, and staff. Uh, the Canadian Federation of University Women Southport is a local group of 80 women who are committed to the advancement of women's equality. We're part of a provincial, national, and international network of clubs working for the same agenda. Our motto is the power of w women working together. Oh, an error message. There you are. Good. Um, you're, of course, aware that Southport Club came about in part because of the horrendous incident that occurred December 6, 1989. In Montreal at L'Ecole Polytechnique, a gunman killed 14 female engineering students simply because they were women. Every year since, Southport has undertaken a vigil to remember these young women and all women who continue to be affected by violence. I'm here at Council again to invite you uh, to, in to join us Wednesday, December 6th at Coulter Parquet at noon to commemorate this event, and I believe Coulter Parquet is completed. <laughs> um, each year I think when I come here that maybe this, year, this will be the year I bring good news in the reduction of violence against women, and yet this year it seems worse than ever. An inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls has begun. But there have been numerous problems and concerns that the families are not being heard and the victims are not being honoured. The inquiry has had to ask for more time and resources to work with provinces and territories around the systemic issues in policing and child welfare. With regard to these systemic issues, a recent series of articles by the Globe and Mail uh, and Robin Doolittle, Doolittle investigated the alarming number of sexual assault cases in Canada which have been determined as unfounded, meaning they are baseless and do not go on to prosecution. The numbers are many more times the average of false claims according to research. Um, and within uh, rural and southern Ontario, uh, some of these are the highest numbers uh, in the country. As a result of the series, more than 50 Canadian police services are launching audits of sexual assault cases. In Ontario, Ontario provincial police officers who investigate sexual assault will soon receive new training, more supervision, additional resources, and maybe most importantly, external scrutiny from local victim support groups. The most recent data from the General Social, Social Survey on Canadians' feelings of safety uh, shows that the rate of self-reporting for sexual assault is much less than any other type of crime, probably because women do not think they will be believed. Uh, whereas women were just as likely to be sexually assaulted in 2014 as they were in 2004, uh, they were just as unlikely and perhaps more unlikely to report the incident to police. And of course, we have the stories now, uh, a litany, really, of male celebrities and power brokers being accused of sexual harassment and assault. The hashtag MeToo has become a powerful tool for women to come forward. And we have done so from all age groups and cultures to say sexual harassment or assault has happened to Me Too. What to do? Well, according to health promotion research, there are usually three strategies involved in changing behavior. One is to increase awareness. We certainly hope to do that with the vigil. Uh, as well, CFUW has uh, brought in a speaker this past October from the Child Advocacy Centre in Barrie who addressed human trafficking. And we know this occurs in both rural and urban centres. And again, most of human trafficking victims are women. Secondly, we need to design and deliver effective policies. Two examples of which can be seen in the Canadian government's most recent policy initiatives at both the international and the national level. 
You may also be aware of the government's strategy to prevent and address gender-based violence. Given the current environment, the tagline, it's time, seems very appropriate. As well, there's been a concentrated effort within workplaces and on campuses to address their policies on responding to harassment and assault claims. The final strategy is to address and help change attitudes and social values that either oppress women or support misconduct. Following the Me Too campaign, a Me Too is not enough campaign was begun on social media with the hashtag, how I will change acknowledging that some behaviors can be intimidating or harassing or even assaultive and looking at ways to change those behaviors. And these were a couple of examples from uh, social media looking at men's statements on how they will change. Now last year, uh, Council joined us to remember the women from La Cole Polytechnique and stand in support of all women experiencing violence. I had hoped to show you a brief video from that time to show all your lovely selves on YouTube, but uh, we don't have the capacity to show video here. So check out YouTube <laughs> for this uh, great video. So this is your personal invitation. Please join us to remember the 14 women we lost in 1989 the thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and the women who live with sexual harassment, assault, and other forms of violence every day, and join us to say this must change. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Just, just for clarity, and I, it's, uh, we all know it's December the 6th, just so everybody knows, so it'll be at noon again. As there, yes. Noon at Coulter Parkette. Thank yep. you very much. So yep. I, I, hopefully we'll see everyone there. Great. Thank thanks. you so much. Thanks again, and thanks for the deputation. Our next deputation is Duncan McCollum. He's here with the Southampton Town Hall Committee Report. Welcome, Duncan. Thank you, Mayor Smith, members of council, media, public, and staff, not necessarily in that order of priority. I'm here uh, on behalf of our committee uh, to uh, present what essentially is our final report, although our committee has indicated a willingness to carry on uh, and uh, help as best they can see this project through to uh, completion. Uh, we've entitled it Southampton Town Hall and Library, Where Heritage and the Future Intersect. Committee mandate uh, is something that uh, you're familiar with since you uh, established our committee, but uh, we are addressing in the report five key uh, subject areas. Number one is the long-term stability and revitalization of the town hall itself, maintaining and improving the use of the building, setting out aesthetic and functional upgrades to the municipal lands surrounding the town hall, and two important ones, creation of a realistic vision for the development of municipal property on the southwest corner, southeast corner, sorry, and confirmation of the requirements to maintain a library in downtown Southampton. And figure out ah, the work plan approach. Uh, you're, I think, pretty familiar with the Tor Dingman Dent Planning SLG planning reports. Uh, the Tor Dingman report was very useful to our committee in that it identified uh, the list of deficiencies. It identified a timetable, a uh, recommended timetable to fix those deficiencies, and it provided some cost estimates to do so. The dent planning was essentially uh, designed to give us some uh, understanding into the attitudes and perspectives of the public uh, about the use of the town hall. And interestingly enough, in the dent planning uh, exercise, community uh, work that they did. It was where the concept of twinning the library and the town hall was first raised by the public as a suggested course of action. The SLG planning reports uh, are essentially the streetscape reports. Nothing has really been done at that corner from a streetscape standpoint, but we have taken into consideration the recommendations of that report. 
We uh, talked and interviewed all of our current tenders and uh, tenants and primary users to understand uh, their uh, needs and their desires, both from a space standpoint, also from an amenity standpoint. Uh, we spent considerable time on a number of occasions with county library staff wanting to understand their feelings about the library in its current location and its current condition. Uh, they were adamant uh, that the library is in the right position in downtown Southampton. They confirmed the desire to maintain it in that position. They were also very interested in an expanded library that would fix some of the deficiencies that uh, have been identified over the years and also the uh, opportunity to make it potentially a library of the future rather than a library of the present or even, some would argue, a library of the past. Uh, there's a, online a tremendous amount of information that we were able to avail through just some desktop research. Importantly, uh, some of the leading thinking of our group came from visits to other municipalities where faced with town halls, libraries, art centers that were suffering through decline. Uh, in some instances, they were town halls that uh, through amalgamation no longer were serving as town halls, so they kind of lost much of their reason for being. Uh, but these visits were tremendously helpful to us in understanding how a problem can be turned into a solution. And we saw many examples of great architectural features, uh, great twinning of two buildings, and that's where we started to develop the concept of twinning the buildings with a center atrium. All of our work fed into uh, work that the Three Stones Architecture and Design Company uh, did. Our recommendations and our input were helpful in, in engaging them along a the right path. And uh, you have seen their report that was uh, presented uh, in September. Uh, throughout the whole process, uh, public engagement has been very important to us, as I'm sure it has been to you. Uh, we've had three public meetings, uh, one meeting, public meeting uh, before uh, any pencil was actually put to paper by the Three Stones group, just to understand how the public felt about the project. The second public meeting was when we had something to present to the public, and the third public meeting was one that the uh, Southampton Ratepayers Association uh, provided us an opportunity to engage uh, their members and members of the public as well. So that was our work plan approach. Quickly, uh, the town hall opened in 1911. The clock was placed uh, in the town hall in 1922. It is designated a historical property in uh, 1979. It has a rich history as a community center. I'm sure that uh, Mayor Smith and certainly Councillor uh, Don and uh, I know Cheryl, or Diane, sorry, uh, would have memories of uh, perhaps attending council meetings there, perhaps attending weddings there, certainly watching uh, arts and musical performances there. Nobody is old enough to actually have gone there to school, but school actually was held at one time in, uh, or not all grades, but some grades in the town hall. Uh, so it has that rich history. It is the heritage of the town of Southampton in many respects. It is certainly a featured uh, item in the uh, town brochures. Uh, the town uh, has engaged in some partial restoration work uh, in recent years following the Dingman report. Um, the most notable being the fixing of the repurposing of the clock tower and also the uh, steps that were uh, main corner steps that were put in last year. The deficiencies, however, are numerous and long and costly. Um, the deficiencies that were identified by Tor Dingman came about as a result of engineering studies that uh, they conducted and uh, architectural studies. And they developed a list of priorities that should be addressed over a five-year period. That was back in, in 2010, 11. And here we are seven years later. Uh, those deficiencies and the costs of those deficiencies, as well as 
two or three other deficiencies that have surfaced uh, in our work. Uh, to bring those costs up to current costs, we applied an inflation factor of just 5% construction inflation cost, and I'm sure that's probably understating what uh, cost of inflation has been for construction work in the last seven or eight years. But we're now faced with deficiencies that were identified as wanting to, needing to be fixed in a three to five year period. We're looking at deficiencies between 1.5 million and $2 million to fix those deficiencies. The library was opened in 1957, well used, but too small, and certainly far from being the library of the future. There has been little or no significant remedial work done on the library since construction. It has serious deficiencies, many of the same deficiencies as the town hall, roof, HVAC system, accessibility problems. Uh, there's concern that there may be mold and asbestos in the building that's got to be fixed. Those deficiencies, and I draw your attention here, those figures are incorrect, my apology. They're 1.0 million to 1.5 million. But where does this net us all? Those two buildings are gonna cost between 2.5 and 3.5 million dollars to fix. And some of those fixes are mandatory. Accessibility issues will have to be addressed. Some of the structural issues will have to be addressed. So uh, I think it's fair to say that within the next three to five years, council is going to have to seriously consider spending two and a half to three and a half million dollars just to fix the current deficiencies. And by fixing those deficiencies, all we've really done is add stability to the current building. We haven't made it more attractive. Uh, there is no uh, demountable stage in there. There is no uh, mezzanine balcony. All of the amenities that are in the recommended uh, program that has been presented by the uh, Three Stones Group. So that takes us to how do we make a solution? How do we get a solution? We think the solution is really a community place center and a vision associated with that. It's a vibrant and leading edge facility, two facilities actually, with full period restoration of the town hall, demolition of the present library, and building of a larger stylistic library of the future, matching the heritage and intersecting that with the future linked by a central atrium, and with the proximity to other municipally owned properties, the boathouse, the art school, the Coliseum, we really have a true community hub where we can provide a full range of activity, learning, and entertainment. Can go all the way from using the boathouse to teach people how to uh, fix boats, to build boats, uh, get rid of the uh, storage uh, of the boat, uh, in that facility and, and make it a, an active use facility. In the Coliseum, we've got the green room, which is a room that can be made available as well. And importantly, in the, uh, the new restored town hall, if you will, lots of extra space, another 2,500 square feet of rentable space uh, and uh, in four different rooms. In fact, uh, you will recall, and it's in the report here, my presentation, if you look at the upper level, that upper level is essentially really set up for large events, business meetings, where in the assembly hall, we can now seat between 225 and 250 people with our recommended approach. Uh, we've got uh, over on the library side, there's no library on the upper level. Uh, that's where we have a, uh, a full catering kitchen, where we have uh, other meeting rooms, uh, we have access to outdoor terraces, so there is truly a place now where a large business meeting convention can be held in town. The other thing that we did was we said that we want to, to work with other venues and programming centers to strengthen Southampton as a major arts, cultural, and heritage center. That's the iconic representation of Southampton, and it contributes to the economic well-being of Saugeen Shores. Uh, most often people say, well, you know, the museum has got a theater there. 
theater there only seats 108 people. Our theater, taken to the recommended approach that we are suggesting, will be able to seat between 225 and 250 people. What does that mean? It means that we can bring touring groups, the groups that go to the Roxy Theater, the groups that go to the Jubilee Theater in Walkerton, the groups that go to theaters in Petrolia, the groups that go to the uh, Concarden Arts Center, groups that will stay for one night or two night shows because there is enough seating that they can make it an economic reality. So those are events that we currently can't handle and we don't get. Uh, it's also interesting, uh, I was advised that uh, Bruce Power had to hold a meeting in Walkerton because there was no facility in Saugeen Shores that would handle their needs. Um, perhaps somebody would be aware of that, but uh, it did come to my attention. So we want to work with the other venues. We think the way to work with those venues is to collaborate with them in programming and venue use. And so that we don't compete with each other, but we build on what each other is doing. And we think that there's an opportunity for joint program with the museum, probably also the churches, which are very heavily involved in arts and excuse me, culture presentation. Importantly, uh, we want to ensure that the community place center vision is financially stable, resulting from the increased use. It's interesting, at the present time, the town hall is used between 75 and 90 times a year. It has an operating deficit of about, before we lost a major tenant when Carol Norris pulled out uh, during the construction phase, uh, it was an operating deficit of about $10,000 revenue versus maintenance. That operating deficit is now close to $20,000, but it's not a significant deficit. So financial stability is important to us. I'm gonna skip these. Um, in favor of what's in the report. Uh, maybe a little hard to read. I'll, I can come back to them if people uh, desire, but let me go to the other report, which you do have, and speak to some of the defining features. Currently, we have an assembly hall seating between 140 and 160 people. We will end up in the future with between 225 and 250 people. The seating style is currently chairs only. The future is a retractable seating arrangement and chairs. Either one can be used or both can be used. Stage type and size, it's currently a fixed stage. It's an 800 square foot stage. It, we're proposing a demountable stage. A demountable stage will allow us to use the stage in many different configurations and will lend itself to the versatility that we're wanting that assembly hall to have. And that uh, stage uh, will be uh, barrier free, which it currently isn't. Uh, people do have to uh, climb upstairs to get to that stage. Um, we're going to, in the assembly hall mezzanine, uh, we don't have one currently, but we're proposing to have one. It fulfills a utilitarian purpose. It allows access up to the clock tower and reduces the number of ladders that uh, people have to climb. It also uh, would be an audio visual center for performances and it provides some additional seating. Multi-purpose rooms, um, zero really at the present time, or before under the new recommendations, 2,500, just slightly over 2,500 square feet. Street level accessibility, we don't have it currently in the town hall. And it will be, we'll have full accessibility obviously in the new atrium area, which will be the entry point for both the library and for the town hall. North end and at the south end of the complex. Elevators, we currently have in the town hall a small lift. It's uh, small by size and it's a week by operational methodology. And what we're proposing is two full public and service uh, elevators. One in the atrium area at the front of High Street and one at the rear 
as you enter the complex from the rear. The one f at the rear will provide service to the uh, stage level for uh, props, and things of that sort. Uh, we'll have a full-size kitchen. We have a kitchen now. We're proposing that that be turned into a, uh, uh, a meeting room. It's probably the best, best view in Southampton of the uh, waterfront. You should go up and stand there sometime and have a look at it. Uh, we're going to make that a meeting room, and we'll have a full catered kitchen facility over in the, uh, on the upper level. Um, amphitheater, we don't have an amphitheater now. At the present time, when we need to do a performance, it's in the assembly hall, and so when the assembly hall is being used by one party, there's no place for another group to go. And what we're going to do is create an amphitheater down on the lower level, if you will, the first level, and that's depicted there in the blue circle, and that'll have seating for 100 people. And it will be visible from all levels of the, uh, of the uh, library side and the uh, town hall side, as well as the catwalks across. It will have 100 tiered seats, so there's another seating capacity availability. The library will go from 2,400 square feet to about 5,400 square feet. At a minimum, uh, to meet the standards of the uh, Library Association uh, and the provincial level, uh, there should be one square foot for every uh, uh, person in the catchment area. The catchment area working off the 2011 figures was about 3,400 uh, people. Uh, I took the liberty of upgrading that to the 2016 increase that we experienced, and so now the, the minimum standard is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 38, 3,900. But really all that does is it sizes the building to the proper size. We want to take the building to the next step level, which is the library of the future. And what does the library of the future look like? What did I do wrong? Library, I didn't touch it. Okay, Library of the Future. This does not, should not be interpreted as the library staff telling us that this is exactly how they would propose to configure that library and use it. But it's a study of the literature and talking with the library staff. The library of the future will have some of these characteristics. It'll be a multifunctional information hub for the community. It won't simply be a place where you go and take out books. It will be the entry point to the digital world. That has tremendous implications in terms of placing technology into that facility. The library of the future is going to move from being collection-centric to being people-centric by providing programs and services that people want, and people need, in order to succeed in the new world. It'll be all in one space learning for learning, consuming, sharing, creating, and experimenting. The old library had fixed places in it. It had hard chairs, it had desks, it had tables, it had racks that were fixed. Now, the Library of the Future, and we've seen examples of this in many communities across North America, they're having drop-in work and study areas, flexible meeting places, movable walls, open space. They also, interestingly, have become centers of exterior and interior design excellence. And they've supplemented that by being centers for lifelong learning with targeted programs from children to seniors. One of the other things that's been exciting in many of the examples that we've seen when they talk about design excellence is that they're using their design excellence, 
Many of them have water walls, they have living plant walls, they have green, uh, green growing roofs, and they're turning that into learning opportunities and teaching opportunities to kids in the neighborhood. So the library of the future is, we think, really an exciting concept. What's our community recommend, committee recommend that we do? We're at this point, you have seen the uh, presentation of the consultant's report. Get my notes here. It's important to acknowledge that we do support and endorse the overall design concept work coming from the consultant. Uh, after all, their starting point was much the input and recommendations that we provided. We feel that they have provided a very workable solution to stabilizing the building, creating the open spaces, uh, the streets, uh, state activity. And what they've done is, in their design work, they set the stage, we think, for much greater use of the facility. I can't tell you, Mike, how many weddings will take place at the town hall, but I think it will be one of those exciting facilities that people will find it, they will use it, and they will be happy with that experience. But every member of our committee is also a taxpayer, and we're mindful of the price of the report that the consultants have presented you in September. Uh, we think that uh, there is opportunity and we would believe that the staff probably should lead this. Work with the consultant to seek cost reduction possibilities. Possibilities that would reduce the cost but would not negate the excitement and the the feel and the opportunity uh, and the integrity of that uh, uh, twin facility. Possibilities uh, are probably associated, cost reduction possibilities, probably associated with reducing the footprint size or eliminating some of the amenities, i.e. the demountable stage, the retractable seats, things of that sort. We're mindful of the fact that in successive meetings, you've had to deal with uh, expenditure, proposed expenditures for a uh, new police building, for a new pool, and now for a, a new uh, community center. Uh, I think we take the cue in part from your discussions about the pool, and that is that I think there needs to be some strong investigation of the government funding availability. In fact, some of our committee uh, feel strongly that really what we need to do is instead of looking at each project as a single entity competing with other projects, uh, provide a dedicated resource that looks at all of the capital funding requirements and seeks out where funding can logically come from in a very proactive way rather than waiting for a single project to be approved by council funding being investigated at that point. Uh, it's, it's a different approach perhaps. Uh, I think it would be helpful uh, to us, certainly from our committee standpoint, because we recognize that uh, we're not like a police station. We're not a, a required uh, capital expenditure. Uh, we're a discretionary capital expenditure. But we think that we're a capital expenditure that should be uh, approached as a serious uh, consideration. And let, let's, let me just speak to the cost. The actual cost, uh, construction cost, is estimated at $8.9 million. It has a contingency of 20% built in. I took great comfort in reading uh, your uh, CAO's uh, comments that uh, at the stage of preparing for tender documentation, we should be able to reduce the uh, contingency cost down to 2%. I think that was for the police station. So I take great comfort in the fact that that 20% is not necessarily cast in stone as, a, as an expenditure. If you take the $8.9 million and you subtract off the 2.5 to $3.5 million and you subtract off about a 10 or 12% cost reduction, which we think would be feasible through discussions with the consulting firm. 
you're down to about a net incremental cost of about $5 million beyond what you have to do sometime over the next three to five years. And we think that that kind of makes it perhaps a more meaningful project at those cost parameters. So we think government funding is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, we have great comfort uh, and great feeling that we can do a public subscription on this uh, undertaking. And uh, from people that we've talked to and people that are library patrons and people that are town hall users, we think uh, capital funding is somewhere in the neighborhood of two to two and a half million dollars over a five year pledge period would be realizable. If we don't do it, you're not gonna be able to persuade the public to spend three and a half million dollars to fix the deficiencies. I think that's the reality. It's not, those deficiencies are not exciting things to fix. So I think the opportunity to engage the public in some fundraising really occurs when you decide to, to bite the bullet and do the whole project. What we recommend as the immediate next step is to issue an RFP to take the project to shovel-ready status. Uh, the consultants, Three Stones, recommended uh, identify what it would cost them to take it to the next step, but uh, those cost parameters would dictate that uh, we should be looking uh, at other proposals. So we essentially would uh, be recommending that you follow the same course of action in terms of getting it shovel ready as you're proposing to do with the uh, police station. That's the end of my presentation. I've gone over the time limit. I apologize for that, but uh, if there are questions, I would be pleased to answer them. Thank you, Duncan. I'm sure there's questions. Any questions from, or comments from committee members? Deputy Mayor Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Duncan, and thanks to your entire committee. Uh, I mean, you guys have done a huge amount of work. You've been working now for what, 18 months or almost two years maybe on this uh, on this uh, project, and uh, you've done a huge amount of work. I mean, just following it along over that time and reading the minutes, and I mean, you've, it's been a massive undertaking for you and, and on a volunteer basis, and I can tell you well, I certainly appreciate it, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well. And um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's a really – it's a really cool project. I mean, it's a neat looking design that you've developed and clearly we have deficiencies that we need to solve one way or the other. I mean, it's really, accessibility is not optional. It's, it's, it, you mean that that's one element of this you talked about, the difference between optional things, things we have that are optional to do and things that we have that we have to do like police stations, but part of this is, is not optional, part of it is mandatory. So, I mean, um, so we have to do something and I guess the key thing is I think what you're talking about doing, um, I think, is ultimately the right approach. We got to get to a point. That, you know, you you gave us a couple of scenarios there financially, um, and got, managed uh, quite quite expertly to talk the number down to five and a half million dollars, which I was impressed by. Uh, but the uh, but but the possibility still remains that it could be 11.4, right? I mean, that 20 that 20 point spread on the contingency could just as easily go the other way, right? Those things could still be so. So you know, you're talking about a project that could range in there. Five and a half million dollars is a much more doable project. You know, if you could ever get it there, it's much it's much more difficult at 11.4. But the key thing is we need to figure out what it is, right? And we get to the point where we know what it is, uh, and then this council could make a decision as to what percentage of that it would be willing, it could possibly fund. And I think that's an important thing and something that I mentioned around the pool too. It's for council, it isn't a question of our desire, right? I mean, council has a desire to see this facility bill. I think everybody around the table would want to see it built. Um, it's a question of our of our financial capacity to fund it. Uh, and and eleven point four million is something we just don't have the capacity to fund. We just we just couldn't spend that money, right? So um, but we could spend some percentage of it and we're on the hook by the sounds of things based on all the work you've done and I believe your number for you know three and a half, right, ultimately over the next few years. So um, so, you know, I think you could think about that as the sort of number where we might have to end up as a municipality, right, if at, at your $11.4 million project. So, so you know, you've got a, that's a fairly significant funding gap there to look at. And um, ultimately, though, I think that's the point. We, we you know, you can, you can have where we could be comfortable, where the municipality could ultimately be comfortable, and, but then we need to pin down the total number 
and figure out how we get there after that. So I think that I think that what you have proposed is the right approach. We need to do more work, get down to a number that's within that plus or minus two percent, and then council needs to make make a call as to what portion it can fund, and then. We have to have the discussion about where where the rest of the money comes from. How do we how do we roll it out? You have some you have some interesting ideas about how we could look at all of our capital projects differently. Um, I I could tell you back that our staff I think is looking at every possible way of of I keep saying skinning that cat. I probably shouldn't keep saying that, but that's what I said last time. So we're looking peeling that peeling that onion. We're you know we're 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 looking at it. We're you know. Because we need funding for a lot of things, as you point, rightly pointed out. So, um, so I so I am supportive of the of the recommendation that you've put forward uh, for how we go forward, and um, and I'm interested in seeing where that number file number ends up, and then hopefully we can uh, we figure out how we can move forward with this project. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Mike my uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I wanted to thank you too, Duncan, and your committee. And I've thanked your committee several times over the past year and a half. Uh, for all the all the great work you've done, and uh, I know it's been pretty pretty time consuming, no doubt. So, but um, I just uh, had, a, had a few uh, well, a question of of uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, to our CAO, and then one to, to our Director of Community Services, and then a couple comments about the report as well. Um, assuming um, we were to spend, and I'm going to I'm going to still use the 11.4 million dollar number. And by the way, Duncan did a brilliant job. I agree with our, our deputy. We're bringing that down to the five between five and a half. But assuming uh, we were to spend um, 11.4 million, um, David, um, we talk about issuing an RFP to take to shovel ready status. Um, to to issue an RFP, I would assume that we would have to have uh, drawings far beyond what what we've got now. Um, um, to get the shovel ready, can you can you give me a rough number, what it would cost to get to that issuing an RFP to take it to shovel ready? What are we talking about investing? Because once we make, once we make a decision to get to an RFP shovel ready, are we not kind of saying we're going to move forward with eleven point four million dollar project? What are we investing if we do that one step? You, Mr. Mayor, I can answer the the first part of your question, Councillor, and that is. Consultants will use a ballpark of 10 to 20 percent to get to shovel ready uh, status, and, and that gets you very close to final budget. So, in, in order of magnitude for this project, it would be about a million dollars uh, to get to shovel ready, uh, ready to go, um, and that would be a, a detailed drawings, and it would be uh, very close to a tender documents. The, 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 one of the challenges with going that far is if you're not ready to build, the shovel ready uh, documents do date themselves as the building code changes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, David, I just so, you know, if we get to that, once we, you know, if we get to that point, I think it's a very, very really, I mean, that's an important point for this entire council to consider that if we, if we do agree to get to that RFP stage and commit one million, perhaps, um, we're probably making a statement that we're moving forward with $11.4 .4 million project, in, in my, that's my opinion. Um, the question I have of Jane, uh, Jane, how many dollars have we invested in the town hall? If you can give me, I'm sorry to put you on the spot here. Approximately over the past five years. Just to give you a second for this one, but over the past five years, how much have we invested in the Southampton Town Hall and what is in the budget for uh, 2018? Yeah, over the um, last four to five years, just shy of $400,000, I would say, predicting. Um, the budget and that was a uh, majority of that was the clock tower repointing that we uh, completed that project and the exterior steps as well and um, another uh, a few other small variable items in there as well um, as proceeding and moving forward for 2018 we're looking at about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars and that's in keeping in line with the Tor Dingman report um, really to complete some of the deficiencies in the auditorium okay thank you just a couple comments um if I could, um, in the report, we, we talk about a performing arts center. Uh, we talk about a convention center. I, for me, as a council, to make an informed decision uh, on such a, a project of such magnitude, into that, and I'm going to use 11.4, getting it down to five, five to six, which is, is a much better number. Um, 
Bef before I'd be able to make an informed decision around performing arts center and convention center, and those are the terms used in the report, I, I'd, I'd, need, I'd need to look at uh, the needs assessment, a business plan, what it would cost to operate such a facility, who are the users? I, I, I had a good chat with a uh, contact I have in Georgetown, one of the sites that the committee looked at, the cultural budget's $925,000 for cultural services. Um, but the center that the group went to speak to, I think their operating deficit is around 110,000. They told me in an email, um, which is a good number, and that that's over that's over 200. That's uh, 240 different performances in that in that theater over the course of a year. I'm talking about plays and films and so on and so forth. So, um, I, gu I guess one of the, one of the things that the Tor Dingman Port and Dent Planning Report did not include, at least I don't recall. Is, is around the feasibility study in terms of who are those users? Where are they coming from? We've got a Roxy Theatre, 25 minutes from Southampton, Blythe, about an hour away, two theatres in Concordon, one in Walkerton. Um, I guess my question would be with the Performing Arts Centre, um, has, that, has that need been determined? Has the Convention Centre, with a CAW Convention Centre 15 minutes away, um, has that been fully researched in terms of are there available dates at the convention center at CAW that, that they may be able to lease out to community groups? We, we ran an OSM conference down there a good number of years ago, and uh, they have all the rooms, meeting space, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I guess before I would be able to make a decision of getting to an RFP to take the shower ready, approximately a million dollars if we use that number, um, I would want to make darn sure that we're committed to the $11.4 million project before we got to an RFP because uh, we do spend that million. I, th I think we're committing ourselves. So um, I, 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 just to finish off, Mr. Mayor, if I could, I had a nice chat with the executive, the, the manager of the Bruce County Museum. And some of you may be read they just completed, completed a pretty in-depth feasibility study for, for additional archival space and for community programming space. And I, I just wondering, uh, I, I like to know perhaps maybe through to Duncan, um, in what depth, uh, into what depth did your committee, Duncan, go to in terms of meeting with the museum to see if, if we are in fact duplicating any of the space that they're thinking about building? That's an eight to ten million dollar project, um, pretty significant fundraising campaign that they could be heading out into, and it needs Bruce County approval of an impact does that have on community fundraising events and campaigns and what what kind of an impact does it have on um, space that we're, we would be planning for the Southampton Town Hall 20 with the library and what the library is doing where they're trying to create a community hub at the same time so are we duplicating so Duncan are you did you, how many uh, meetings did you have with the Bruce County Museum staff and and um, did you talk about uh, the service they provide and what this new venue would, would, I've, would provide? I've had discussions with the director. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. In fact, I was involved uh, as a contributor to the uh, project that they ultimately are now recommending to county council. <clears throat> that project is essentially to create space for archival storage and for collection storage. They will repurpose some of the space and use that for programming, but they're not planning on building a new theater. They're not planning on building significant new uh, offering amenities. And as I said in the report, the key is to, I think, work with the museum, to work with the churches, rather than to compete with them. And I don't see any reason why an ongoing committee can't work with those to or those organizations to establish where the best place would be to hold a particular performance. Uh, let's face it, if uh, they're looking for a, uh, a lecture theater, uh, the lecture theater at the Bruce County Museum probably is very fine, 108 people. It very seldom, I think, goes over that uh, capacity requirement. Uh, we, we're not interested in creating a performance theater for 108 people. To do so would be directly competitive. That's why we want to step up to a level uh, of seating capacity that doesn't exist within the community. And yes, it exists in other communities, but I'd rather 
keep our people in our community rather than exporting them to spend their dollars in other communities. So just to finish up there, Mr. Mayor, this is a, so just to, um, again, for me to make an informed decision as a counselor, those are the things I'd be, I'd be you know, the business case, the numbers, numbers, numbers. Uh, it's one thing to fundraise. It's another thing to operate a facility. And, and the future usage report, uh, is there really a need for performing arts center, uh, convention center? Those are the kinds of questions I'll have when it gets to that point, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Minaj. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm going to work backwards, I think, and, and speak to the, to the, uh, the concept. Of, by the way, amazing report, amazing work from the committee, and we're very thankful for, for all of your service for, for this. And, and you've taken us on a great journey, and it's got a, it looks like a great ending. So all that's been said before me is, is all very valid. But I'd like to get to the last points first, and that is, why would the museum, if, if, if they know that we're going to um, potentially have this, this larger theater enclave, um, they, couldn't they repurpose their theater building to be more archival space? It's in the same location. So why can't we partner with the museum and, and, and switch, the, switch the narrative there and say, if you're going to do something, uh, we, would like to, we would like to move forward with the, the theater aspect. You use your theater for, for an internal development, and it, maybe you reduce your cost. It might be a win-win situation for both of us. So what I'm really interested in, though, speaking to is, is the financial model, and I've, I've been saying this for some time now, and I, we've got some new financial help coming our way and uh, with our new financial officer. Chief Financial Officer, and I'm sure that we can have those discussions. And I understand when the Deputy Mayor Luke says that uh, some is discretionary and some is not. So the police station, we, we decided to make it be everybody pays a share for 20 years. I don't see that model working for the pool or for the, for the town hall library, and, and I'm sure you don't. So what, what, what I do see working is some kind of, of uh, 75 25. So if, if um, let's do that 50 50, which is 75 25, let me explain. So if we got some external grant uh, considerations for 50%, and the town was to, the municipality was to, to offer 25% and challenge the fundraising group to come up with 25%, I don't think we've ever said that we would ever turn down, we know we don't turn down 80 20. Arrangements. I'm sure we can stretch it to 75-25. So, but we should be having that discussion as council, in my opinion, not sending it back to the committee. They've done good work. It's our job now to work with staff and say what comes next. And I would like to find a way to support this and move it forward and not cut it, not, not do what they all do before us, and that is say, we can't afford the next $2 million, so we'll cut it. And it never works for me. And it seems like it always comes back to haunt us anyway. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. You'll be happy to know I've reached a question. And that is I'm not, I, I am concerned with a comment that is made about asbestos and mold. We have health and safety issues for staff and for patrons. So we either need to pull that statement from the committee's report because it's found to be not true or we need to prove that it is true and do something about it. Can we ask staff to please investigate in, in a short term, is there an asbestos and or a mold problem that needs to be dealt with? Thank you. Yeah, I think we can find that answer fairly quickly. I don't think we need it tonight. tonight. We don't need it tonight, but we'll get back to you on that. Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, part of the exercise was really about bringing the discussion to the table. 110 years ago, people in Southampton said, hey, we need a town hall. They built a structure on the corner that, um, here it is 105 years later, still standing, still the iconic building, still one of the tallest buildings in Southampton. And, yeah, a few things have changed inside. The fire hall went in, then the fire hall went out. A few walls got um, knocked down or moved around. But um, 110 years ago, there was some vision. There's absolutely no place else in Soggy Shores where the same opportunity exists. So 
I think, um, you know, business plans and, and um, you know, further thought is definitely needed in terms of just imagining, you know, how to, to bring it all together so that it's, it can be paid for and that it's sustainable um, over a longer period of time. But um, it certainly is um, an incredible location. Um, it's in a downtown area. It's on the highway. Um, it's got a lot of land around it that's in, in public ownership right now. So um, certainly the committee, um, Cheryl and I sat there as, as council members, um, certainly the committee um, appreciates um, the interest and, and, you know, we're just now um, hopeful that, that the ball will, will keep rolling, probably slowly, but, you know, it's, it's um, certainly um, city building or town building or community development stuff that, you know, um, we don't do that very often and so it's a chance to imagine creating something that 105 years from now people will look back and say thank goodness that they had some vision to do something so um, certainly as a member of the committee I appreciate um, the, the sort of quiet enthusiasm um, certainly there's other other pieces of information to come but that's the idea that you know it's um, there's no other place we can do something like we could do on that corner with a heritage element and a future element thank you mr. mayor Councilor Madison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, Dunk, and your committee, thank you very much for the work you've done. Um, <clears throat> I want to work a little backwards as well. The big point we have to look at is that if we do nothing, we're looking at a three to four million dollar cost just to repair what's already there, and what's there isn't really worth repairing to that amount of money. We have a library, which is the center of the town, which is an iconic location. The number of people that use that facility is increasing every day, every month every of the year. There was just a report in the Toronto Star about the number of adult patrons who are frequenting libraries to use the computers. Their knowledge is going up, and that's what this library does. So I think if we do nothing, we're, we're just going to be sitting there. We're going to be paying 3 to $4 million anyways just to renovate it. The town hall is going to need major work to get up to the level for our accessibility. I like the idea of, of twinning some projects together, and, and as everybody said, we do need to look a little more at how we can get some funding in here, but this is a project that's going to lead us into the next 20, 30, 40 years. We're looking at sport tourism. We're looking at the growth of this town. We've just had a, a major investment with the announcement of our hotel. The town's going to be growing, and we need to have something that's going to attract the cultural unit to this. So whatever we can do to get this going, I'd like to help with that, so thank you. Any further comments? Questions? No. Well, thank you, Duncan. I, I think you've uh, heard some pretty good discussion here, and I think you, you probably knew what was going to be the, the issue when you came here, and I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that the committee has done, um, and I suspect we're going to ask staff to, to look at these options, and, and I certainly like your offer of the committee of, of uh, providing more input onto this if you have it, so I think we'll turn it over to our staff for, for, for a path forward. Stu, go ahead. Sorry, through the whole piece of our work, we're excited by the prospect of a re fully restored town hall, a brand new library of the future, and an atrium in the surrounding area. And I guess the feeling of our committee is that that's an exciting proposition to take to the government for some funding opportunities. It's an exciting proposition to take to corporate sponsors for naming rights at that facility. It's an attractive proposition to take to the public. It's a lot better proposition to take to the public than simply, you know, fixing the stairs and putting a new elevator into the town hall. So I, I think where the excitement comes is from the total vision rather than simply doing what's absolutely necessary to stabilize it. Thank you. Again, thank you, Duncan. I just, just, I, I, I did like your comment about some of the great things that have happened in there. I've participated in many of them, but you may remember that there was a provincial magistrate's court in there for many years, and I participated in that, and it wasn't a very good outcome for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never had an experience down there, but it was always up on the second floor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, then our next uh, item on the agenda is the general government staff report, and it has to do with 
a pre-budget approval uh, for an item in our um, chief CAO is going to present. Yeah, I, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll speak very briefly. Uh, we're not looking uh, for uh, expending the funds prior to, to uh, 2018, but we want to be able to commit uh, to spending them in 2018. So we're looking for your approval to do that. Thank you, David. Then the recommendation that Council authorize pre-budget approval for two items in the 2018 operating budget. One, the tree inventory management summer position, and two, conversion of permanent part-time to full time finance position. Any questions? All in favor? Both of me, that's carried. So uh, the next, oops. We have a number of items for Committee of the Whole Information. And one report of Department Ed's an information report on the Recreation Master Plan. I don't know if you want to speak to it, Jane, or if there's any specific questions to it. We can entertain them now. Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jane, uh, thank you for this report uh, on the Recreation Master Plan. I um, actually, um, in light of what, um, of Duncan's report, um, some of the things that struck me as he was talking about the, um, the vision of the community hub fit right in with our goals of becoming a youth-friendly community uh, and also um, examining whether we would uh, apply to be an age-friendly community because I think that that, that center would, would help to fulfill both of those goals. Um, but I do have um, a couple of questions on that specifically. Um, the youth-friendly community, um, you mentioned... Um, the PlayWorks Youth Friendly Community designation. Um, is it possible for you to comment briefly on what that PlayWorks is, what that program is, so that um, this was under the um, possibility of getting funding under the PlayWorks, or getting, sorry, a designation as a youth friendly community? Oh, 17. I don't have it designated as 17, but. Um, in response to uh, the youth-friendly uh, aspects and programs that are currently available, and there, there are many, um, staff certainly has had some conversations in regards to youth-friendly and, and certainly our capacity on what we can take on as far as, I'll say, workloads. And um, what we've presented to you right now is what we have the capacity of doing. We certainly see youth friendly as a, an added aspect to, um, uh, to opportunities in the horizon. At this point, it's not something we can take on, but certainly we are aware of opportunities um, as they pertain to youth friendly and uh, we'll continue to seek out some um, in partnerships that we can do to at least provide something in the community without doing the direct programming itself. Okay, so just to clarify then, are we applying for youth-friendly community designation through PlayWorks? Uh, no, we're not, not at this point. Okay, um, because I, I think that, um, you know, to me with the demographic um, changes in our community, um, with all of the young families that are coming in, um, moving here, uh, as well as the fact that we do have a significant um, aging population, I think that uh, I really support moving ahead with both of those initiatives. Um, my other uh, question is about the curling clubs. Um, and I noticed that I didn't see anything um, listed uh, for 2017 and 2018 in terms of uh, advancing the recommendation to have discussions with the curling clubs. Could you comment on that, please? Again, it comes down to capacity, what the department can take on. Um, we're certainly familiar more specifically with the Southampton Curling Club operations and to, at an arm's length, um, the Port Elgin one. We are aware that their operations are running satisfactory at, at this point, and um, we have no intentions, uh, at least within the next two years, to being part of those discussions in um, something we'll consider, but again, it all comes down to capacity and what we're able to do um, at this point. Okay, so um, just to follow up, it, 
does that mean that things are running smoothly and you don't see any need to change? The curling clubs are outside identities, other than the fact that one curling club has a lease agreement with the municipality. Historically, we've not been part of the operations of the curling club. If the time comes and that they're looking for assistance, we certainly will provide some assistance through that process, but uh, it's not deemed as a, as a high priority for us at this time. Thank you. Councilor Minaj. Um, I have notes on, on a few of those. I wondered what what you would like, Mr. Mayor, as or as staff would like, as some sort of formal feedback process. I'll, I'll make a couple of comments now, and then maybe maybe there's another, another there's another method. So, in particular, the number six and number seven, along with uh, number fourteen, they all talk about once the pool is is has been decided upon, which I'm assuming we should be making that decision sooner than later. Um, some of these are short decision time frames and some of them are long and they, they're to do with the existing space of the existing pool and whether we make it into a, a youth center gymnasium type facility or not. For me, I would like to see that heavily linked and packaged with the new pool. Like f for me, it's like build the new pool and immediately repurpose the old pool, not leave it sitting there for a long time. You know, I'd like to see them, I'd like to see them linked and, and have a real, uh, a real go at both of them at the same time. Um, number 30 talks about the BMX track and the need to possibly relocate it from its current location. And, and yet, my understanding is that the pool of the future is on the west side of, of this building, not the east side. So I wondered about uh, the future, why we would need to concern ourselves with the future of the BMX track, unless I'm missing something here. Um, number 35 talks about beach volleyball and expanding beach volleyball from its current number of courts to more courts on the, on the same footprint, the Port Elgin Main Beach. And I think we've heard plenty that we should not be doing that. If we don't want to, if we want to make sure we don't incite a riot, the eight courts that are there are the limit. Otherwise, we're going to have, I don't know what, I don't even know how to suggest it because it would be inappropriate. So I think that that number 35 really has to be uh, reviewed or I've, or I've mistaken what I'm reading, reading. And finally, I'd like to talk about, and I can't see it here other than the potential for a new ball diamond complex. For me, some of our financial issues could easily be taken care of with the immense piece of property that is available to us bordered by Bruce and Joseph Streets. And if right now, as they say, while the iron is hot, developers are, are building in and all around there. We have if we're opening up discussion with the Board of Education, we have a soccer field, called, used to be called Beaner Soccer Field. I, I planted the grass and I dug the trenches for the watering system, as Jane probably knows, along with a lot of other people. We're not using that soccer field, and it's just sitting there. So Northport School has, there's been talk, there's been talk that that maybe they need an expansion and they already have taken away some of their playing fields. So for years we've, we've pushed around the concept of could we facilitate their needs and some of our needs for the future with a healthy discussion and could we realize some strong monetary contributions to some of these projects we're having trouble funding by taking a different approach to the Bruce Joseph Street region and the large amount of land that's there that, that, that we're currently not using as well as the land that we are using. So I leave those as, as um, comments and thoughts. I'm willing to hear if anything needs to be said tonight from staff Jane or a process that we can, uh, we can uh, send in additional thoughts and comments on, on these items that will or, or has that, is that process over and, and this is the, the final dis deciding uh, document? Go ahead, Jane. Um, 
Yes, I appreciate all of your enthusiastic input um, from all the councillors and the, the purpose of the report this evening was merely to give you a caption of what we have done since we uh, received the, for the past year of the recreation master plan and, and what staff is looking at uh, working at towards in 2018. We go through a strategic process in determining uh, again when I talk about capacity to what we can do as far as capacity. We're aware that there's a number of recommendations in the report that can be I'll say grouped together when we talk about new pool and what impact that will have. Um, I encourage any of you at any point to pop into my office and we can have a conversation about some of these uh, items on here and if uh, you'd like to see them uh, brought to the, the top of the priority list more than others and we can certainly take a look to see what we can uh, reduce or accommodate. Follow-up, and I thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, so that's an interesting concept, and and certainly I shouldn't be. I don't think I should be parading into the office with with some with some uh, changes of priority. What I should be doing is is giving you giving you my opinion. But what I'm asking for is a process that says. So we've, we've got the recreational master plan, the community's been involved, we've had a committee involved, we've had some input from us. Now I see a list of some very tangible op opportunities and options, and, and now I would like to know, you know, are we able to say, well, that one shouldn't be medium term, we really think it should be short term, and here's the reasons why, deliberate over it, and have a revision to it. What process affords us that? That's a process for the most part that staff will take and uh, I think there has to be some reliance on um, the expertise that we've received from Monteith Brown as well. Um, we rely heavily on the recommendations that they've provided to us. What you see is a caption of the recommendations that they've, get, they've given to community services but what you don't see is all the other work that's happening outside of those recommendations as well. So again I talk about a strategic process and how we accomplish these um, recommendations as well keeping up with their other Okay, oh, Vice Deputy R. Huber. Um, thank you. Um, the, um, the report from the director um, doesn't reference some other activities that Councillor Matheson and I sit on the Recreation and Active Transportation Committee and we um, have established three little subgroups to kind of pick up on three topics that are in here to try and advance, you know, some ideas. I'm a little bit further but, um, you know, I'd, certainly um, it would be great if, if any member of council wants to come to the Recreation and Active Transportation Committee meetings, we would love to have your input there too. But um, there are some, th that committee is, is trying to, to look at some of the items in here too and, and you know, give them um, the additional research and the ind additional enthusiasm to move them along. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're, one is ice surfaces, one is um, outdoor fields or just baseball diamonds, and then playgrounds, which picked up on the youth thing. So. We have three sort of little subgroups there that are um, working towards some some action items too over the next uh, three to four months. Any further comments? If not, then I'll take a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Madison, all in favor, we'll take a 10-minute break for reconvene council.